Good morning everybody and welcome to our service of worship for Haywood Baptist Church. It's a real pleasure to have you joining us this morning and I pray that as we journey again through some of the stories in the Gospel of John that you'll be encouraged and challenged and changed by the love of God that is on display in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, it's through Jesus and faith in him that we are given this invitation to sit at the table of his feast, to worship and to grow. Let's therefore begin by setting our minds and our hearts upon Jesus in prayer. Let us pray together. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you that in and through Jesus Christ, you have revealed to us a God of blessing and love, a God who longs to draw us forward towards greater wholeness. And yet a God too in that who challenges us to leave ways of death. And yet, though you know we are weak, you fill us and provide us with your promised Holy Spirit that we might see the way before us more clearly, that we might be enticed by your goodness and grace to keep going forward and persevering. Gracious God, who gives us all things, we come to set our minds and hearts upon you this morning, praying that you will journey with us so that growth and transformation and healing and wholeness may be ours. Be with us, therefore we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going as per to uh, sing our first song of worship before we come back for some Bible reading and reflection on that reading. Oh 
come again in glory, judge the living and the dead. Every knee shall bow before him, then must every tongue confess. reading this morning comes from John's Gospel and we're in chapter 6 and verses 35 through to 59. I'm just checking there. Okay, so here is what the Bible says to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from me comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, 
Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. We're following on again today in John's Gospel from the story or the stories that we heard last week. Now, we've been exploring, haven't we, on a weekly basis, this idea of uh, in Jesus Christ, um, who God is, is fully on display for us. And in particularly what seems to be on display is God's affirming heart, God's love for all people. We've seen that demonstrated in the kinds of people that John has Jesus talking to and doing miracles for. But we noted too, didn't we, last week that in the two healing stories, Jesus, or perhaps John using Jesus's words, tries to ramp up the challenging aspects of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And particularly, we saw last week, that idea that following Jesus just for signs is a superficial faith and it's not deep enough. And also we saw the challenge through the healing of the man at the pool of do not continue in sin. In other words, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, it's not just the benefit of the healing that you get, but it is a call to a radically new life to a new direction, to a new way. And in order to stop sinning, it's an appreciation that we've got to start moving. We've got to move away from identities that have bound us and dictated to us in the past towards our true identity in Jesus Christ. There is a challenge, of course, in that, and we explored that last week. Now, today we've come to a passage where Jesus is talking about himself. And here, uh, John's gospel becomes much more explicit now about the nature of Jesus. And therefore, this speech is a little bit controversial for the Jewish leaders, teachers and people. And of course, as a writing that's put down um, a number of years after this, Anyone that picks up this text and reads it from a Jewish perspective will find it difficult too. But also Gentiles might find some of it difficult. So we started this speech. Jesus starts with a proclamation. And his proclamation is, I am the bread of life. Now, in John's Gospel, there's about seven times where Jesus says, I am, and then something with it, like, I am the true vine, I am the living water. And here's the first time that Jesus says, I am something, added on to that. And it's quite common knowledge that I am is a way of mirroring back to when God first meets Moses at the burning bush. And in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, when Moses says to God, who shall I say has sent me if the people ask? And God says, tell them I am has sent you. 
So when John has Jesus using these I am statements and John records them seven times, there's a particular point going on here. Jesus is perhaps aligning himself with God and the God that revealed himself to Moses. So right from the start, there is a proclamation which is shocking. Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am. And there's a, a lot of certainty in this uh, passage, a lot of proclamatory or prophetic certainty. Jesus seems to be certain of his identity and then certain that he will raise people up at the last day. A real powerful and profound certainty. The volume is now being turned up by John for the readers to see who Jesus really is. So that a crisis point might be reached for the readers. Now after Jesus has proclaimed, and the whole passage really is a proclamation, I am the bread of life. He also says that he's been sent. He's the bread that's been sent from heaven. Bread that's come down from heaven. Either sent by another or sent in partnership. But Jesus has been sent into the world. At just the right time, Paul says, Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse under the law. There is a timing about the life and ministry of Jesus. So Jesus has been sent. The bread has been sent. It comes down from heaven. Now this for me is speaking of Jesus becoming flesh, becoming a full human body and sharing the whole human experience. Jesus comes in flesh as the bread of heaven, the incarnation. God enfleshed, God in body, God not ethereal floating around there, but God wedded to a human body and flesh thus in some ways revealing that the human body is just as important as the spirit. Now that'll be a challenge to Gentile readers more than Jews, but it is a challenge because for, for Greeks, and there was a particular movement going on in the early church, there was this idea that all flesh was bad and only the spirit mattered. Well, of course here we've got something quite different. The God who is enfleshed, who is real and tangible and knowable, is taking upon himself flesh. Bread coming down from heaven. Bread is a great thing, isn't it? You eat bread, we eat food in order to live. Bread gives us, if we just say about bread, the capacity and the energy to fulfil all the other tasks of the day. And when our energy gets low, we have some more bread with a meal. And our energy is brought up. So Jesus is saying he is the bread that, kept, that comes down from heaven. Now... Jesus, I think, is making it, and John is making this analogy too, around the fact that, first of all, we've got the Moses thing about I am sent me, and Jesus now says, I am the bread of heaven. But also, this is an analogy to when Moses feeds the people of Israel in the desert when they're on the journey out of Egypt and they're basically dying and a miracle comes by a Moses. But Moses mediates the miracle. He's not the miracle. He mediates the miracle. Whereas here, Jesus is 
the miracle. He's the worker of the miracle, the source of the miracle, the miracle itself. Jesus is the bread now that is given for the purpose of living. And that's why you get a little discussion or a little talk from Jesus saying, look, in the days when Moses mediated a miracle of bread, everybody still died. But this bread that's come down from heaven is the kind of bread that when you taste it, when you eat it, ensures you will not die. And that's the certainty when Jesus keeps saying, I will raise them up on the last day. Now, when Jesus says he is the bread that comes down from heaven, you know, the Jewish leaders and the followers or the gatherers here, again, they do what Nicodemus does. They completely misunderstand the point by looking at things from a human point of view. We know Jesus is mum and dad. We know where Jesus lives. They don't quite see that God is so big that he can work miracles in this way. Jesus can be sent in this way. Now, there's a lot of mystery in all of this. About God choosing people and drawing people and those that understand what Jesus is doing are truly drawn by God. And I often think that's a little bit of polemic to the misunderstanding Jewish people of the day. Almost as if to say, um, if you're not understanding, it's because you're not chosen. It's a bit in, in and out, really, isn't it? But I guess that's also to make people pray and wonder whether the way of Jesus is the true way or not. It might just be a little tricky device being used. But certainly there's something about, if you're misunderstanding all of this, according to John, and the words that, that he uses for Jesus, then the only reason you're misunderstanding is because you're not being drawn by the Father himself. Because if you were, you would understand these words and you would believe and you would have life. So let's go on a bit further. Jesus not only says he's the bread that came down from heaven, looking back to the incarnation, God becoming flesh, but he also talks about being given bread that is given. And the bread, Jesus says, is my flesh and blood as well, too, is given. Jesus is saying, not only have I purposefully been sent. But I also willingly give to in sacrifice. So that the fullness of what God has is given to this world. <laughs> Jesus is just spelling out to us that he will give himself to us through his sacrifice. And it's a great mystery, the cross. It's a fantastic mystery. And there's, there's so many different theories of the cross in the New Testament. It's hard to go over them, but there's a sense in which bread for it to be enjoyed, has to be given from somebody to somebody. And so Jesus is going to be the bread that is given to us. And of course, as that bread is given, then there is a call for us to participate. And this is why I think Jesus uses the idea of eating eating flesh and drinking blood. It sounds like cannibalism indeed, doesn't it? But I think it's this sense of participation. You don't get any benefit from bread unless you eat the bread and it becomes a part of you. And so you don't get any benefit from Jesus unless you believe and assimilate his way deep into your life, like eating. We are called to participate in this act, this invitation to eat the bread that has been given. But this bread is eternal bread. This bread is mysterious. Now, this is, is probably going off piste, 
But I was reminded when I read this passage of I watched this documentary and uh, it was about people. Maybe I shouldn't be watching stuff like this, but it was about sort of the psychology of people who engage in cannibalism. And one of the interesting things they said is that people can get so obsessed with somebody, especially if, they, if they've got this particular mindset, that they eat them so that that person becomes fully part of them. And so in a way, we're, we're not being told to literally physically eat the person of Jesus, but we are being told somehow to participate in him in a way that he becomes a part of us. And without that believing participation, there is no life within us. And this is a challenge. And yet, with the choice to believe and the choice to participate, the choice to eat the bread, the spiritual bread that has been given, there's a guarantee, because Jesus keeps reiterating it, that we will stand on the last day. In other words, the great faithfulness of God will keep us because our participation in Christ ensures us that the grace of God has drawn us already and will keep us to that last day. We will stand. We will have life. We will have fullness in him. Now, that's great. Why would anybody object? What's going on with all the to in and fro in here? Jesus proclaims who he is. He unpacks the fact that he's been sent, but also in the sense he's not passive. He's also active in that he is the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus unpacks how he's going to give himself. He will offer himself as bread to the hungry. And then he's challenged that, therefore, you must eat this bread. You must drink this blood. With the implication that in doing so, you will stand. So why would this kind of make people walk away or dispute and stuff like that? Well, a number of things, really. The idea of feeding and teaching in the culture in which this gospel is written is something that women did. Women fed, nurtured and taught their children. So perhaps the imagery here is very feminine and therefore troubling in a society that may be enamoured with more masculine, powerful images of God. Perhaps that's the offence that's being caused. Jesus is turning images around and upside down and even destroying some. Perhaps the issue is Jesus' insistence on eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Perhaps it does sound like cannibalism. It does sound a little bit weird. If you take it literally, of course it does. And maybe uh, a bit of resistance to this, which comes up after this story, um, hints for us that uh, there may have been this dispute in the early church about whether flesh really matters or not. So John might be using this story as a way in which Jesus challenges people's rejection of the physical and the earthly. So maybe that's why John has people confused and questioning here in dispute with Jesus. But also it might be that this story is hinting at the fact that communion, the Lord's Supper, which which people call a sustaining grace, is something that we must participate in. Where we reenact the life, death and resurrection of Jesus together. Perhaps participation in that fleshly feast, because they were tangible earthly things that were used, was also being dismissed. So John is using this story of Jesus to really challenge the early church 
that the gathered community taking communion together is a transforma transformational act or ritual that the forsaking of will make us poorer for it is something of a grace sustaining meal it centers us it brings us back to identity true identity the very thing we need to go towards so that we stop sinning so i think jesus today might want to say to us, do you understand that I am bread that is eternal? Bread that is offered to you that you might be able to live a full life, an eternal life, a whole life, a quality of life that as yet has been beyond you perhaps jesus is calling us to understand that he's intrinsically so at one with the father that believing in him and feasting on him is becoming a part of god himself that there is no idle stuff going on here so perhaps jesus wants to demonstrate for us through the analogy of bread that he's been purposely sent and he was active in the sending. He wants to give you and I bread today. And he calls us by faith to come and eat this bread. And the way in which we do it is through belief and faithfulness to his teaching. That we might stand. And we have to be careful not to reject Jesus. Or this portion of teaching because it might turn cultural ideas on its head. If Jesus was really perceived as being much more feminine in that feeding and teaching role and that might have been problematic, we've got to deal with the fact that God can take many forms, many guises in order to give bread to the world and we have to not reject God's offer of life just because of the package in which it comes. We have to understand that there may be many teachings around in the world, just as there were in John's day, that would tell us, well, this doesn't really matter anymore or that matters. And we have to discern. We have to press in to Christ himself. And we are challenged to participate in the simplicity of the Lord's Supper to realign ourselves and, re and orient ourselves and plan ourselves into the image of Christ to whom we are growing into. We are rooted and grounded in him to grow up in him, to mature toward him. We are called to feast today. And in feasting upon Christ, we are called to continue the mission of Christ, the mission of God into this world. To be the new sacrificial givers through whom others taste and see the goodness of God and understand the great faithfulness of God in raising all up on the last day to fully participate in a feast like no other. Amen.
every single galaxy was your design, your majesty displayed. Your glory shines before our eyes. The more we see, the more we love you. Thank you, as always, for joining us this morning in our time and journey of worship. I pray that you have been blessed as you've been with us. Feel free to share. If you're on Facebook, share the service for others. And if you're on YouTube, you can send the link to other people who you might think would be encouraged by our service. Please know that you are loved, that you are welcome and that you are, fir you are affirmed by God. And therefore, the things that God offers are offered in and through Jesus to the whole world. That means you can eat this bread and I can eat this bread too. And also it means that in eating and then living, we can share this bread with others in a world starved of the depth of understanding of faith and wholeness in and through Christ. Let's get on with our task to go and manifest Christ to our world. And let's go with the words of the grace ringing around us so that we might be a blessing to all. So let's say the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and ever more. Amen. God bless you all and I look forward to joining with you again next week. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your strength